Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. Over in Proverbs chapter 1, our key verse for today is verse 1. A wise son makes a glad father. It's Father's Day. That, I think, is a rather appropriate verse to be looking at during Father's Day. Now, you know, I think that everyone who is a parent wants to have wise children. In all my years of ministry, I don't think I've ever met a parent who hopes that their baby will be stupid, or a jerk, or a pest, or a pain in the neck, or a moron, or an obnoxious fool. Imagine a dad holding his sweet little baby boy while the mom is adjusting the booties. You know, I've never heard them say, we're going to have to work hard to make this little boy into a drug-addicted, drunkard, derelict who sleeps in the gutter covered with vomit holding an empty whiskey bottle. Or, we've got to make sure that this baby girl gets good training to be a streetwalker. No, of course not. Parents intuitively want their children to have greater success in life than they themselves have had. Only parents who are self-centered jerks want their children to hold them down and keep their children from reaching the full potential that God has given to them. Even pagan parents sacrifice and save for years to be able to pay for their kids to go to college. They give up things that they themselves want so that they can provide for their children. They make sure that the children have enough to eat, that they have proper clothing to wear and get enough sleep. They take their kids to the doctor when the children are sick. They limit what the kids do so that they can protect the children, like they keep the kids from climbing into the bear cage at the zoo and they stop them from picking up snakes. But Bible-believing Christian parents also pray for their children. They make sure the kids are in Sunday school and church every week. They have family devotions and teach their children to pray before meals. They discipline their children according to the standards of Scripture. They have family times of fellowship with other Bible-believing Christian families so that their children will have friends that are growing up under the same biblical standards that they themselves promote. You know, we associate the book of Proverbs with Solomon since he wrote it. But we must remember that Solomon was David's son. To a great extent, this book of Proverbs is actually a compilation of wisdom that King David taught to Solomon. But did you know that there was another wise man who made a huge impact on the life of little Solomon when he was only a child. Another man who made a huge impact on the life of Solomon when he was only a little child. Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, and her grandfather was Ahithophel. That means that Ahithophel was Solomon's great-grandfather, and Ahithophel was the wisest royal counselor that David ever had. If you're a grandfather, never forget that. You have an obligation to pass down the mature wisdom of years to your grandsons while their own fathers, your sons, are still growing up. How do we know that Ahithophel was Solomon's great-grandfather? We get it from piecing together two verses in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 11, verse 3. Here we have the narrative in 2 Samuel 11 of David seeing and lusting after Bathsheba. It says, And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then we discover who Eliam's father was. In 2 Samuel 12, 34, very next chapter, Eliphelet, the son of Ashasbai, the son of Maacathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. Eliam was Bathsheba's father. That made Ahithophel Bathsheba's grandfather and the great-grandfather of Solomon. Listen to what the Bible says about Ahithophel. 2 Samuel 16, 23. And the counsel of Ahithophel 
which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Ab Shalom, Absalom. When Absalom rebelled against his father David, Ahithophel sided with Absalom because of what David had done to Ahithophel's granddaughter, Bathsheba. It was payback time. Ahithophel gave counsel to Absalom that would have defeated David. But Absalom was a fool and rejected the counsel. David did a great job with Solomon, but he did a lousy job raising his son Absalom. That should be a lesson to us as dads. Having success with one son does not mean having success with all of our sons. But back to Solomon and wisdom. Solomon was a boy who picked up on stuff. Solomon was learning. Through all that family chaos, Solomon was on the sidelines watching the narrative play out. He was learning from David's mistakes and sins as well as from David's direct teaching on wisdom. Solomon was a wise son who made David and Bathsheba glad. Absalom was a son that caused his father horrible shame and even the threat of death. Remember our key verse for today? The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. There is the contrasting son to the wise son, a son who is not wise, and Solomon knew this well. Proverbs 10.5, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Or 17.2, A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame, and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. Perhaps Solomon had Absalom in mind when he wrote Proverbs 19.26, He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame, and bringeth reproach. But the contrast, Solomon. Solomon had been raised in such a way that he wanted to make his dad, King David, proud of him. He'd been raised in such a way that he loved his mom and never wanted to make her sad. It appears that David and Bathsheba had done some serious parenting with little Solomon. Unfortunately, they also committed serious sin that Solomon copied when he got older. Dads, remember that. Your actions speak louder than your words. Your sons will imitate your sins as well as your acts of righteousness. They will also imitate their grandfathers if the grandfathers spend any time with them. Little boys want to follow men that are important in their lives. They also want to honor their moms, especially as they see their dads doing it. But little boys need men to follow, men to copy, men to be their heroes. Are you a dad or a grandpa? Your little sons and grandsons want you and need you to be their heroes. They will want to copy the righteous acts of their heroes, but remember, Little boys will also usually enlarge and enhance and refine your sins so that they are better at the sins than you are. So be careful not only what you teach, but be careful what you do. The whole theme of Proverbs centers around what a father ought to teach his children, especially his sons, so that they can be not only successful in life, but so that they can please God. Remember chapter 1? The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. And where does he begin? Verse 7. The fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and a chains about thy neck. The book of Proverbs is designed to teach immature, foolish, selfish, hormone-driven boys how to become wise, self-controlled, godly men. In the process, the book of Proverbs also teaches girls and parents how to choose the right kind of wise men to marry their daughters. And it teaches both boys and girls how to avoid wrong life choices that end in sorrow and destruction. Proverbs has four major divisions and covers four basic areas of instruction. We've gone over that in detail in the past, so I'll only summarize it for you here. The four major divisions are chapters 1 through 9. That comprises what I call the hard work, hardware or framework around which all of the later specific detailed instruction is grouped. The rest of that book, chapters 10 through 31, is what we might call the set of software programs that fit the framework established in chapters 1 through 9. Our key verse for today, chapter 10, verse 1, opens the second division of Proverbs, and if you will, it boots up the very first set of software programs that provide application of wisdom. The first section began with the key divisional words that helped divide the book up. Proverbs 1.1 1, 1 said, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Chapters 10 through 24 begin with the same words, The Proverbs of Solomon. That brings us to the third division of the book of Proverbs, which is chapters 25 through 30, uh, 30. And those are Proverbs that were taken from the judicial, administrative, and other writings of Solomon that were culled out of Solomon's writings in the day of Hezekiah. That also begins with that very interesting phrase, these are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. The fourth and final division of the book of Proverbs is only one chapter long. That's chapter 31. That's the capstone chapter of wisdom for the book. The woman a man marries makes all the difference in whether or not his life will be a success in the eyes of God. This chapter is God's teaching about the godly woman that Solomon learned from his mother Bathsheba. But you've heard me preach on this in the past. Bathsheba is not the example of Proverbs 31. Although she was an extremely wise woman, being the granddaughter of Ahithophel, David's wisest counselor prior to his adultery with Bathsheba, instead Bathsheba used Solomon's great-grandmother Ruth as the example of the godly woman. I hope those of you who are older picked up on this a little bit. Did you get it? Ruth was David's great-grandmother, making her Solomon's great-great-grandmother. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather, making her Solomon's great-grandfather. So we have a godly woman in the male line and a godly man in the female line. What an interesting crossover. Male in the female line, female in the male line. What an incredible heritage little Solomon had. That shows the incredible grace of God in making family blessings intergenerational even when there are intervening generations that drop the ball. Don't give up if somebody before you dropped the ball. Don't give up if you think that you've dropped the ball. The final section of Proverbs, that is chapter 31, is introduced at the end of chapter 30 by some very enigmatic and prophetic words about the Word of God, both written and living. That section also has the official introduction that is strikingly different than the other three sections. The words of King Lemuel the prophecy that his mother taught him. The words of Proverbs 31 are called a prophecy. They're not called a set of Proverbs like the other divisions of the book. Prophetically, this section tells you in advance what kind of a life a young man will have who marries the right kind of woman. In contrast to the man who marries the wrong kind of woman, warned against in all the rest of the book of Proverbs. Now listen to this. I never saw this until the preparation of this message. 
Proverbs 1 through 30 is wisdom that David taught Solomon. Proverbs 31 is wisdom that Bathsheba taught Solomon. It says the things that his mother taught him. Both parents were involved in training Solomon, and that shows the connection to our key verse in Proverbs 10.1, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. But it shows something else that never struck me until I prepared this message. It shows that the majority of the instruction should be coming from the father. There is 30 times more instruction that came to Solomon from David than what came to Solomon from Bathsheba. 30 times more. First 30 chapters from David. Chapter 31, Bathsheba. We usually have it in reverse where we expect the mom to be providing the majority of life training for the children. And, and by the way, the book of Proverbs is not just the head knowledge which homeschooling moms usually can give to their kids. Proverbs is life training. Life training. Dads and granddads, you are the ones that God holds accountable for passing on life training. You have to give life training to your children and grandchildren, your sons and your grandsons. You, dads and grandfathers, are responsible for teaching wisdom and life skills. Well, so that's the four different divisions of Proverbs with a lot of other stuff that I threw in there. Uh, those are the four basic areas of instruction and application. Remember, dads and granddads, you want wise sons and grandsons who will make you proud of them. But you know, kids don't just happen to turn out that way. You personally have the responsibility of making an impact in three areas of their lives. Number one, teaching them the truth. And you're going to communicate to them verbally with this, that there are irreversible consequences for all of their actions. Now, you know, even when you repent and you get back on track, you've had some irreversible consequences because things have happened in between the time that you sinned and the time that you repented that make permanent damage, that leave scars, that put baggage on you. You have to teach your kids the truth, that there are irreversible consequences for all actions. Number two, you have to give them, dads, corporal discipline as well as restrictive and enforcement discipline. Corporal discipline means spanking. Restrictive discipline means, well, you were planning on going to Disney World, we're not going to do that because uh, you just ran over the cat with your tricycle and then stomped on its head. Enforcement discipline is where you say to the kid, you are going to cut the grass. I don't want to cut the grass. You are. And you take that little rascal by the hand and you put his hands on the lawnmower and you may have to walk with him holding his hands while he screams and yells, but that's enforcement discipline. So there's corporal punishment, there's restrictive discipline, and there is enforcement discipline. And dads, you are the principal ones responsible for that. And number three, giving a clear lifestyle example in five areas. Dads, you're responsible for this. Men are responsible for this. Maybe you're a youth leader. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you're a, a Boy Scout leader. Maybe you're a, you know, a band leader. Maybe you're a teacher in school somewhere. Doesn't matter. You're a man. You have a responsibility in five areas. Giving an example, a lifestyle example in your actions in your words, in your thought patterns, that is your thinking processes and skills. You can't see the kid's thoughts, he can't see your thoughts, but you can te teach thinking processes and skills. You are to give a clear lifestyle example in attitudes. How do you respond to authority, for example? And fifthly, you are responsible to give a clear lifestyle example in motives, which the boys especially will understand. In other words, you need to explain the reason that you do what you do. You need to explain why you say what you say and why you think what you think. Motives relate to the reasons that you do things. If your children don't understand why you do those things, if you're merely an autocrat, if you're merely some guy who puts his foot down and says you're going to do it this way because I said so, 
That opens the door for them to rationalize why they can reject what you do and then they can choose to do their own thing because they don't have a clear understanding of the consequences. They don't understand the reasons. They don't understand the motives for why you say to do what they should do. Teaching rote drill is not enough, although it is absolutely essential for long-term retention. Rote drill is good, but that's not enough. There must be more. Explaining the reason that you do things helps your sons and daughters develop a Christian worldview. It gives them the foundation so that they can apply that worldview to new fact patterns that you may never have the opportunity to teach them. However, understanding the motives of a Christian worldview will enable them to come to the correct conclusions because you have trained them to understand biblical reasons for making decisions. That brings us to the contrast between knowledge and wisdom in Proverbs. And note well, there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. The accumulation of knowledge of facts is a presupposition for each of the four areas of instruction. Knowledge deals with facts. Wisdom deals with the application of facts. In other words, Solomon assumes, through most of the book, that the boy has done his homework and learned the facts. Raw facts are not the key issue in Proverbs. Even an idiot and a fool can know raw facts. Proverbs assumes that the young man will have learned the facts because facts are the stuff of which knowledge is composed. But the underlying question in Proverbs is, how do you interpret, use, and apply the facts to real life situations? That's wisdom. Learning facts relates to knowledge. Knowing how to apply the facts from the divine perspective is wisdom. Teaching that is the responsibility of the father and the grandfather. That's what David taught to Solomon and what he failed to teach to Absalom. That's what Solomon is trying to teach his sons in the book of Proverbs and how to do it. But you know, Solomon went through the same thing that David did with Absalom. Even the wisest man on earth can have a fool for a son who failed to learn what his father taught him. In Solomon's case, that's evident from the fact that Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was a fool, and within the first week of his reign, he split the kingdom because he listened to the fools who were his own age rather than listening to older wise men who sat under the teaching of his father. So the four basic areas for instruction and wisdom are laid out in Proverbs 1.3. You'll notice the three of these areas deal specifically with leadership, with law, and with principles for ruling as well as general areas of life. A man who understands these areas will be a divinely qualified leader. That's what you want your sons to be. You want them to be leaders. Because if they're trained well and if they have a biblical worldview, they will lead with Christ as their example. That man who understands these areas will be qualified in every sphere of authority, family, church, work, and government. These four <laughs> principles are contrary to the world's principles of leadership. Verse 3 says to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Do you know the difference between the four? If you don't, you should write this down. I have spent more than 60 years studying these four things. Wisdom. Learning to apply God's divine perspective to the facts to get God's results on life issues. Let me say it again. Wisdom. Learning to apply God's divine perspective to the facts to get God's results on life issues. Justice, the second thing that Solomon mentions. Learning to apply God's standard of righteousness to every fact pattern. Learning to apply God's standard of righteousness to every fact pattern. Judgment. Oh, this is a tough one. Learning how to see past the smoke screens that people put up so that you can understand the real facts in every case and be able to tell right from wrong. 
Everybody always wants to justify himself and make the other guy look bad. Judgment is learning to see past the smoke screens that people put up so that you can understand the real facts in every case and be able to tell right from wrong. And the final one, equity. We used to have in this country what are called courts of equity and courts of law. Those have all been merged into one, sadly, because equity is something that we miss an awful lot in our society. Equity means applying equal standards to every person in every situation of life so that you don't end up playing favorites and cutting with deals with people that you like while coming down hard on the people whom you don't like. Applying equal standards to every person in every situation of life so that you don't end up playing favorites. So you don't end up cutting deals with people you like and coming down hard on the people you don't like. Last year, I divided the book of Proverbs up for you into the 21 different areas of life that every young man should know, every young woman should know as well, but that fathers are responsible for teaching their sons in particular. This is not a matter of head knowledge. This is a matter of life principles. There are 21 of them. Friends. Right friends and wrong friends. Danger areas that alert you to the type of friends that they are. Number two, wise use of money. God's principles versus worldly principles. Three, wise use of material goods. We covered these in detail last year, so I'm just listing them for you just to put this back in your mind as we go through what we're studying today. Number three is wise use of material goods and resources for eternal purposes. Number four, and this is a big one, integrity. Integrity. What's integrity? Integrity means honesty, truthfulness, reliability, strength against compromise, things like that. Integrity. Number five, another big one in Proverbs. Knowing and doing God's will. In other words, having a right relationship with God. Number six, and a dad can certainly teach this by having his sons work alongside with him. Wise use of skills. Those are issues related to diligent work. Number seven, wise use of time. Your kids are watching, what do you do with your time? How do you waste time? You've heard me say this before, you can never waste time. You can only waste your life because life is made up of time. And when you use time for frivolous purposes, you are wasting your life. Number eight. Oh my, this is an important area in Proverbs. Control of the tongue. Book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the mouth and the tongue. Number nine, accountability versus excuse making. Teaching your sons to take the blame when they deserve the blame and not to try to push it off on somebody else. Teaching them to be a man and saying, I was wrong. Number 10, worldview. That's life perspective. That's what we're talking about in the message today. Teaching them what is important and valuable and what is not. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. What you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. <laughs> do you do that? For example, I've decided to be late to church today for the glory of God. I've decided to skip prayer meeting for the glory of God. I've decided to pass on this little item of gossip for the glory of God. See, that's silly. You're right. It's not only silly, it's sinful. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything in your life is to be tested by that principle. And dads, especially 
your children are watching you. They're listening to your excuses. They're seeing when you pass the buck and try to get someone else to take the blame. They understand your worldview by what's important to you, where you spend your time, energy, resources. Next time you want to do something, say, I am doing for the glory of God. See if it fits in the sentence. It will tell you whether or not what you're doing is right or wrong. Then we talked about the seven different deadly sins, and Solomon deals with all seven of those, which, of course, this was taught to him by David. David himself would have fallen into some of these sins and understood the deadliness of them. But there are seven areas of life that Solomon deals with, which we call the seven deadly sins. Pride versus humility. Greed versus generosity. Anger versus forgiveness. Sloth versus diligence. Envy versus kindness. Gluttony versus self-control. Lust versus love. And there's a lot in there because Solomon had a lot of experience with that. Sex and evil women and good women and how to choose a wife and marriage and moral purity. Number 18. As attitudes and motives, both good and bad. There are many of them dealt with in Proverbs. Fools. <laughs> Someday I hope to preach a message on the different kinds of fools in Proverbs. There are many different kinds of fools in Proverbs. We have the English word fool, but there are multiple different words that are used for fools in the book of Proverbs. And each one tells you something about the character of an individual whom God calls a fool. Number 20, personal self-control in all situations. And there are many of those listed in Proverbs, you know, having self-control in personal situations like, for example, alcohol. And then one of the most important also, there are so many that are absolutely essential. You have to communicate them all to your kids. Leadership character qualities. David was a wise leader. He passed that on to Solomon. Solomon was a wise leader. He made some stupid mistakes. He did some foolish things, but he was a wise man. People came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. How in the world could this king in this rinky-dinky little piece of land that has no natural resources, how in the world could he get so rich and control trade and be so powerful? They came to hear him. Leadership character qualities. For us, that includes not only natural talents, but spiritual gifts, alertness to opportunities, decisive action, and many things like that. I think it should be self-evident that a man must know these things before he can teach these things to his sons and to his daughters as he trains them for the kind of man that they will want to marry and the kind of man they must avoid at all costs. For a father to teach these things, he must know them first. And that requires diligent study and practical application so that he can set an example for his sons to follow and so that his daughters will know what they're looking for when they look for a husband. You know, I, I recommend the, prov the practice of reading Proverbs every day. I've done that ever since high school, much more consistently since college. I read at least one chapter of Proverbs and or a chapter from one or more of the other biblical wisdom books every day. Ecclesiastes, Job, James, First and Second Peter, and so on. Oh, there's so many things here. I can see I'm not going to have time. I'm on page 8 of 15. So I'm going to skip to the end. <laughs> Let me move over to the end here because I have some more things to say that I think these other things were illustrations of what uh, we just listed for you. But I will spare you that. We move down to the final areas that fathers and grandfathers need to pass on to their children and grandchildren. The attitudes, good and bad, the different kinds of fools, personal self-control in all situations, and leadership qualities. So remember the key verse for today. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Men, do you know these things? And more importantly, are you teaching them to your sons and grandsons and to your daughters and granddaughters so they'll know what kind of man to look for? 
Are you teaching it by the way you live? Are you teaching it by your specific, specific oral teaching? You know, your children may not learn. They may not obey. They may fail, as did Absalom, David's son, and Rehoboam, Solomon's son. But it is still your obligation before God to teach these things to your children and grandchildren and to live in a way that shows that you believe these things. For fathers, not just mothers, but for fathers, raising children is an immense responsibility. Men, God will hold you personally accountable for teaching your sons and daughters these things that deal with life principles. Even if the children refuse to learn them, you will be personally held accountable for not having taught them. And you will be blessed for having taught them. The question is, did you do it? Are you doing it now, not only with your children, but your grandchildren as well? May God bless you and grant you wisdom to bear this responsibility like the man that God called you to be. Happy Father's Day. Be a man. Enter the battle, battle with courage. Hear the call of God and be armed with the word of God. The victory is yours. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. And that you've called men to be men. You've called Christian men to be men of God. Men who are faithful in communicating with their sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters. And if they live long enough with their great grandsons and great granddaughters, the way that you have called us to live, not merely communicating facts, but communicating wisdom, communicating life principles, Communicating what not only makes them successful in temporal things, but communicating what makes them pleasing in your sight. Teaching the boys to be men. Teaching the girls what kind of man they should marry. Men responsible for 30 times as much teaching of boys as women in the book of Proverbs. Great wisdom from Solomon's mother, from Bathsheba, in chapter 31, the 30 chapters that Solomon learned from his father and passed on to his sons as well. And you, Father, by your grace, caused it to be written down. And you've passed it to us so that the men might be the men you have called them to be. We thank you for Father's Day. And for those of us who are men, we thank you for giving us the privilege of standing as men in a world of darkness, standing in contradiction to the weird changes that our society is going through, where men are no longer men and women are no longer women, and everybody has sort of morphed into everybody else. You've called us to be men so that our children and grandchildren might know what you expect and what you will bless. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 151, A Mighty Fortress is Our God Will Save.